the main topics to cover today, uh, benefits of automation. Uh, some of them are, are quite obvious, some of them are given. Uh, others may be uh, new for you to think about, different perspective. I wanna to touch on a little bit of uh, innovation from the automation team here at KL, uh, share with you some of the stuff that we're working on and talk about different system configurations and last, uh, service and support, which is a critical piece of, of any uh, capital purchase, uh, any investment into advanced technology. Um, so we'll roll right into that. To give you a bit of background, um, Zoetis acquired uh, the KL automation brand a handful of years ago. It's just over five years now. Um, we are what we would call a sister company to the Embrex. Uh, brand so the the bio device and automation group is uh, is the the two groups working together under the Zoetis umbrella. We fall under the the poultry division of Zoetis. Uh, Zoetis, uh, as everyone knows, is uh, the world's largest animal health company, um, and and the Embrex and KL automation brands are a very specific uh, niche product. Um, within that, that uh, large corporation. And we bring cutting edge, world-class service and uh, solutions to our customers. So just, to, just so that you have a little bit of a feel of, of how we all fit into to the big uh, Zoetis family. So benefits of automation. Um, you know, it, there, there's, there's some driving factors behind um, the innovation that we bring to the market. There's industry needs. Uh, those are the things that drive our innovation. So um, in terms of, of those specific benefits, certainly manual operations uh, are, are, are commonplace in most hatcheries, but we look to identify which manual operations uh, contribute to reduction in throughput or um, uh, issues with overall operation of, of your facility. Biosecurity, as, as we all know, is becoming more and more critical. Um, we, we introduce our systems with biosecurity solutions in mind. Uh, the reduction of labor in, in the facility, for example, reduces the, the exposure to, to the outside. Um, designing equipment so that it can be sanitized and cleaned helps reduce those biohazards. So um, by, by living that culture, um, hand in hand with our friends and brothers and sisters at, at Embrex, uh, that is that is uh, one of our driving uh, cultural elements within within our business is to is to make sure that what we design is appropriate for uh, the hatchery space. The automation gap uh, that we call it. Uh, I apologize. I don't know if anybody's. There's a uh, Amber Alert in Ontario, so apologize. Um, so closing the automation gap between the machines, I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit more, but that, that's an area where we, we find we gain the most in terms of efficiencies. Uh, reducing the redundancy of material handling, for example. Those are, those are areas that we consider low-hanging fruit and, and it drives a lot of the, the solutions that we've put together. And of course, animal welfare and humane handling is absolutely critical. Uh, again, becoming more and more critical in, uh, in the marketplace. And so our solutions, uh, our innovation is driven to uh, improve those conditions wherever possible. So, and then and address the needs within the hatchery. When we talk about manual processes versus automated processes, what we see, and, and we, we all feel this, I, I feel it on Monday mornings, I'm, I'm not necessarily 100%. Um, if my boss is listening, I'll tell you I'm 110%. But the reality is, is that there's natural variation in um, the, the human cadence when we're working. There, there's variation all the time. After lunch, uh, at the end of the day, on a Friday, all of those are factors for humans who are uh, working in a hatchery, working anywhere really. And so what we look at is automation will provide 100% output uh, all day, every day. It, obviously there's lots of other caveats to that, but 
properly maintained equipment, uh, properly run equipment will run at a consistent rate, consistent throughput. And so what that does is it gives you a much greater accuracy in terms of predictability of uh, working hours, for example. Uh, continuously putting out at 100%, you know what your rate is, you know what your working hours will be. A manual process, by its very nature, uh, is variable. And so um, in the transfer room, for example, it's critical that we get uh, the vaccination uh, the Innovo vaccination completed and transferred into the hatch trays at the right time. And so with automation, you improve the predictability of that, that window. You have greater accuracy over that time. You have greater control over that window by uh, replacing a lot of those manual processes that, again, contribute to the variability and, and, and replacing them with automation, which gives you that consistent throughput. And so um, it, it's one of the, the key um, uh, improvements or benefits in terms of automation, where if you have a full team uh, in the hatchery working, if you can control uh, the, the rate at which they're, uh, they're running, the hours that they're working, um, that gives you that, that greater accuracy in terms of predictability and, and hitting that window. Uh, making sure that the chicks get out to the farms at the right point in time so that you can get that throughput, you can, you can make those deliveries on time. When we talk about return on investment, um, we, we often, again, as, as, as uh, an example of manual versus automated solutions, we don't talk necessarily just about the one role um, in terms of uh, labor displacement. So reduction of labor uh, in one station, one operator. Uh, typically what we're trying to look for is uh, a number of, of benefits and greater efficiency. And, and I'll walk you through this scenario here to sort of paint the picture. So it, in this example we have here, we have a separator. The separator is conveying the chicks uh, via conveyor to a gender ID table. We have a number of, of people in place here uh, completing the gender ID. We then have a conveyor conveying the chicks, males to one counter, females to another counter. Uh, back up here, the empty, dirty hatch trays uh, are automatically conveyed into the hatch tray washer. So th that's sort of, this is a, a very generic setup, uh, pool room setup and chick room uh, with the separator, gender ID, chick counters, and then also hatch tray washer. So when we talk about manpower uh, requirements to run this system, again, just, just very generally, we have somebody that's presumably stacking the clean hatch trays at the back end. Uh, we have somebody that's stacking and we'll say moving around the, the chick boxes at the back end uh, after the chick counters. And we may also have somebody at the front end here loading the empty clean chick boxes onto the in-feed conveyor. And then of course, we've got uh, our gender ID crew who would be working in this area here. So all of these people are working to support this particular system as it's configured. Again, it's a very general uh, configuration, but it's something that, that uh, uh, is quite representative as well. So now, we have a person here that's destacking the hatch trays onto the separator. The rate at which this operator here in particular operates has a direct effect on the rate that the hatch trays are passing through the washer, which affects the, the we'll say the utilization or the labor utilization of all of these other operators. So the hatch trays going through affects a person the flow of chicks to your gender ID affects the rate that all of these people are operating. The flow of chick boxes, both empty clean chick boxes and full chick boxes. So this one particular person has a direct impact on the labor utilization of everyone in that system. And so when we look at opportunities for 
automation. Uh, in this instance, we would possibly suggest uh, Jerry, we lost your, your, did you mute? Jerry? Jerry, we Throughput lost your, there we go. Oh, we lost so your audio for a minute. Uh, please. Can you still see me? Yep, yep. Hear me? Just okay. watch audio. So, Thanks. so this this particular operator's um, rate is is actually affecting everybody else. So, replacing that single position with a robot gives you that hundred percent throughput, and it also um, gives you better utilization of of your labor elsewhere, so that you can balance uh, their tasks based on on a fixed throughput. So that's, uh, that just gives you a sense of, of when we talk about um, return on investment, it's not just looking at this one position um, and the displacement of one laborer. It's how does it affect the overall system, the overall operation in the room? Because again, maximizing the utilization of this labor is an efficiency that's gained and, and needs to be considered in terms of the ROI. In any example that we would come up with, whether it's the transfer room, the pull room or the chick room, we would look at the same scenario. We would look at upstream operations, downstream operations to see where we can get the greatest value in terms of automating. The, the, the calculations for ROI are always complex um, and and in this instance, we're just talking about um, labor displacement and labor utilization. There's a lot of other factors that go into the ROI calculation, but in every event, we're looking for that opportunity that creates the greatest payback, the greatest uh, value to, to the operation. I'll give you another uh, example of, of where automation um, result in, in what I would call a paradigm shift. So it's, it's the, the need to see um, automation um, uh, and, and how you use your labor somewhat differently. So in this example that I've got here, um, this is a transfer room set up. Uh, at the bottom here, we have uh, a rack unloader, so a trolley or a rack unloader. It's unloading egg flats. Uh, it's conveying the egg flats to the Embrex Inovo system. So here we're removing uh, the clear eggs. We're vaccinating the eggs and flats, then get conveyed to this station here. Normally, this system would have uh, perimeter fencing to keep it safe, but we've removed that for clarity. So here we have a robot. Uh, that does the transferring uh, activity. So egg flats come into position, the robot grabs the egg flats and it places the eggs into clean uh, hatch, hatch trays that are on this trolley system here. Uh, the empty egg flats are then conveyed, we wash them and then we reload them onto clean uh, racks or trolleys. So. This is, a, this is what we would call a standalone solution. It's a series of machines that work together as a system uh, connected by custom sections of conveyor. And so each of these stations have different input requirements. And so at the beginning of the process, we have uh, the egg flat rack that has to be loaded and unloaded. So uh, if we're running, for example, James Way 84, at uh, we'll say 50,000 eggs per hour, they're loading and unloading racks every roughly six minutes. So it's 30 seconds of work for uh, an interval of once every six, six minutes or so. So loading and unloading racks here. Uh, we also have the full racks here with clean uh, egg flats on them. So once that rack is full, we have to unload it and reload a clean one. 
again, it's roughly a job. Here we have stacks of empty, clean hatch trays that are being fed into the transfer system. And then the full trays have to be uh, moved over to the hatchers. So they have to get pushed through the hatchery to the hatchers. So all of these tasks are partial manpower requirements. So you're not using a full head count at each one of these stations, you're using partials. So when you think about manpower requirements, you have to keep in mind that you're only using this person here once every six minutes for 30 seconds. You're using somebody over here once every six minutes for 30 seconds. Same with over here. Every six minutes, a new stack gets pushed in. Every six minutes, another stack gets pushed out of the system automatically, and it has to be pushed over to the hatchers. So these are, this is where, from a hatchery manager perspective, you start to look at the different tasks that need to be combined uh, to, to add up as close to one full uh, head count as possible. And so those are the complexities that, that hatchery managers have to wrap their head around in terms of assigning these partial tasks. Um, if, if we were looking at a more traditional operation, you may have one or two people continuously unloading the racks manually. Well, that, that's pretty straightforward. That's one person or two people uh, that you assign to that task. But here, you're only dealing with a partial person. So these are good problems to have where you're looking at you know, a fraction of overall uh, headcount utilization and combining those tasks. So it's, it's something that we work with our customers to try to identify. Again, combining those tasks to get the maximum utilization of that labor uh, and, and the maximum throughput of the system to make sure that it's fully fed and, and running at all times. So this is where the, the manpower considerations uh, vary a little bit with automation when you're dealing with, with fully automated systems. And here again, it's an example of, of you're only using a partial person here and there. So we, we need to try to think how we combine those, those roles um, to make it as efficient as possible. In terms of automation drivers in low labor rate markets, um, it's something that we often discuss. How, how do you pay for automation? How do you put the ROI justification together um, if your labor rates aren't that high. And, and again, going back to, to the points earlier, typically um, labor displacement is, is only one piece of the puzzle. It's only a, a, a portion of the calculation to find that ROI. Um, but there are some really good drivers to consider uh, in areas with, with low labor rates. Um, what we found historically is that um, general labor is, is not necessarily reliable. Um, so absenteeism is, is quite challenging. Um, having to train new people uh, is, is always difficult. Um, in rural areas, um, you, you don't have the availability of a workforce. You don't have as many people. You don't have as big of a pool to draw from. Uh, nowadays, with, with hatcheries being put farther and farther away from urban centers uh, for biosecurity reasons, um, the, the inverse uh, effect is that you have uh, a smaller pool of people to draw from. And so you need um, those, those higher uh, labor pools to be able to man the hatchery, but from a biosecurity perspective, you're driven to, to areas that are farther away. And so uh, the dependence on, on automation is, it becomes uh, much more evident and, and the ROI in terms of day-to-day -day business um, starts to come into a factor. Again, we mentioned high turnover of general labor and having to, to do that training over and over again. Um, that, that's an inefficiency within the facility. Um, general labor coming and going, if you have uh, groups of people, lots of people working within the hatchery, it, it represents a biosecurity as well. So depending on your um, 
entry and exit requirements for biosecurity for for uh, um, cleaning and 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 um, uh, PPE. All of these things create risks. When we have automation in the facility, uh, that automation doesn't leave the facility. So when you're doing your your sanitation in the evening, uh, you know that your chemistry is working to um, uh, get to that level of biosecurity that that you need. Uh, whereas people coming and going are, are are a variable in that factor, and and those have to be considered. Uh, the other thing is is that where we apply our solutions, um, it, it's let's face it, the less desirable work. So unloading egg flats from racks, uh, transferring eggs and stacking hatch trays. Uh, this, is, this is difficult work and the hatchery environment is hot, it's humid, uh, it, it, it's quite challenging. And so you add physically demanding work into that and, and you have jobs that are less desirable, which increases your absenteeism, which makes it difficult for you to get people in that, in that position that's critical to um, your operation. It's critical to, to, to getting your throughput, getting uh, your transfer completed or your hatch completed. We're, we're in a unique environment where we're dealing with living product. And so you don't have the, the luxury of waiting to, for the night shift to come in to finish the work. There is no options there. Um, my background is in automotive engineering I've spent years and years uh, uh, dealing with welding car parts. And if there was any issue with getting labor into the facility, you could always make up for it uh, on the next shift. You do not have that option with living product. So we, we have some very specific demands in the industry. And so automation helps address those challenges. And I, I touched on it earlier, you get a more dependable production schedule uh, with the adoption of automation in key areas. You get that consistency of throughput, you get that consistency in terms of scheduling. And so I, I wanna make it very clear that, um, you know, when we're putting solutions together, it's, it, our objective is not to eliminate general labor. Our objective is not to take jobs away from people. What we wanna do is take away those areas that are physically challenging to operators, um, they, they may be a physical risk as well. Repetitive strain, ergonomic challenges, lifting weights, uh, he heavy product over your head or, or well below your waist. These are all risks to operators. And so our systems address those challenges. And then the other thing to consider when, when we talk about labor is that um, now more than ever, we're, we're aware of the labor requirements in a hatchery with a global pandemic ongoing. Um, we know that physical distancing is a requirement. We all felt the pain early on of, of trying to get, again, a living product uh, through the facility and out the doors to the farms. The challenges that are associated with that while trying to deal with a global pandemic and, and social distancing. So. I, I think that for us, we, we've 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 focused on those that low hanging fruit that gets you the the greatest payback in terms of return on investment, but using a number of different criteria to to justify that that ROI. So we're not just looking at displacing labor again. We're looking at other scenarios where having labor shoulder to shoulder in a hatchery uh, may be a thing of the past. For, for at least the near term and preparations for whatever could come next. So understanding the labor requirements and trying to find good, honest solutions to, to, to resolve those challenges. That's, that's, that's our focus. And again, COVID has taught us a lot of lessons uh, about evaluating what those labor requirements look like. I'll touch briefly on some innovation that I'd like to share with you. Um, in, in terms of humane handling, th there's, nothing, there's nothing new about the requirements for humane handling. I, I think we're all experiencing that there's greater attention to it uh, and that there's greater emphasis on trying to find good 
reliable solutions, good repeatable solutions. And automation is one of those areas that gives us uh, a significant um, opportunity to, to create those um, uh, animal welfare friendly conditions. So when, when we look at transitions between conveyors, we try to minimize that height, that drop. We look at the speeds of all of our equipment to make sure that um, we're not accelerating or decelerating chicks or eggs um, in a way that it, it causes them harm. Making sure that they're properly contained on conveyors and through separators and all these these pieces of equipment. Those are all the things that we we address on a day to day basis. There's there's nothing new about the requirements, but the innovation behind um, addressing them is. In terms of the equipment design, again, we want to avoid injuries uh, to the birds. We want to make everything as smooth as possible and, and as stress-free as possible. So our system configurations, uh, that's one of the driving principles in terms of how we set up our systems, how we make the decisions about how to convey and conveying from where to where. These are all factors that we, we take into account when, when we're configuring this, these solutions. We talked earlier about the requirements for biosecurity and with biosecurity, there's lots of challenges throughout the hatchery, but for us, we see the hatch tray washer as one of those key areas um, where we have the most to gain uh, in terms of improvement of biosecurity. The hatch tray washer uh, literally touches uh, every single tray and every tray touches every single egg or chick that goes through your facility. So it truly is a single point where we have uh, the most to lose, but also the most to gain in terms of doing a really good job. And so in any industrial washing system and specifically one where we're dealing with biohazards, um, th there's, there's what we call the holy trinity of, of, of effective washing. So uh, time, temperature and pressure. Those are the three factors that we take into account uh, to, to optimize the process. The element of time is making sure that we size the washer appropriately. Our washers are sized so that there's a certain amount of time that that box or tray or flat is exposed to the wash solution. And it, it's critical that we make sure that the, the washers are sized appropriate so that we can convey it through and get that, that time element. Because uh, without any one of those three, our process fails. And so time is critical, but that starts at the very beginning, making sure we apply the right washer with the right speeds. That's generally fixed from the time that it's installed in the facility. And it, it really, there's no reason for it to change. The temperature and pressure those are the variables that from a day-to-day -day perspective, we want to in, empower you to control. If you, the, the old saying is, is that if you don't monitor it, you can't manage it. So process monitoring is, is critical to effective cleaning. Making sure that the pump is pushing the wash solution at the right pressure is critical. Making sure that the pump is pushing wash the solution at the right pressure and temperature is incredibly important. So again, those three factors are very uh, important to, to effectively removing the soils from the products and getting a good clean product coming out the back end. We need the pressure to be able to physically or mechanically help loosen and remove it. The heat helps to dissolve the material there's other factors that also contribute to, um, to effectiveness, you know, making sure that the chemistry is right. So monitoring the chemistry concentration in the wash solution is, is important. Uh, so that's another element that we've enabled our systems to be able to monitor. So monitoring temperature, monitoring pressure, keeping an eye on chemistry, these are all critical elements to making sure that you have a, a repeatable, safe process with clean product coming out the back end. <clears throat> All right, so this is a quick video 
uh, it will do far better job of describing the innovation and improvements to our chick shell separator. Um, we're really proud of the developments that we've we've made in in terms of trying to reduce fall heights and improve the conditions on the conveying uh, through the washer or through the separator. And, and so this this video will summarize it a little bit. So um, if the internet's being kind, we should have a video. Sorry, let me turn that down. Okay, just uh, to highlight some of the the uh, changes or benefits to, to the way the system is configured, um, it, it, we now offer an uh, interlocking plastic link belt um, as a cross conveyor, as opposed to the parallel wire conveyor that um, is on the previous versions. Uh, reducing the, the drop heights, again, we, we look to try to minimize drop heights wherever possible, and so through a, a fairly significant redesign, we've been able to reduce those drop heights from the separator. Variable speed, uh, taking advantage of new technology out there with, with VFDs and, and the ability to have some infinite control over uh, speeds and, and precise start-stop positions. Uh, that, that gives us uh, uh, an advantage so that uh, we can cater the, the separator speed to whatever the production value might be uh, any particular day, whether you want it to run um, slower or faster, there, there is that flexibility within the system now. Um, the, the eggshell separator plenum is, is probably the area where we've done the most uh, development in terms of trying to come up with uh, sufficient airflow to remove the eggshells, but also keep the chicks safe and on the belt. So we're quite proud of a lot of the uh, developments on that side. Uh, and, and there's also a few other things that, uh, that we've managed to improve as well. So um, it's a new product. We're very proud of it. And, and um, we're happy to discuss any opportunities that uh, you have within your hatchery about uh, either modifying or, or supplying new. System configurations. Um, so we talk about scalable solutions. Um, depending on your hatchery, uh, your your production vo uh, volumes, we have systems of varying size to, to support that. So when it comes to our washers for or our, our separators, for example, as well as our washers, we have different sizes to address the throughput requirements. Um, but beyond just scalable solutions, um, we also um, like to promote the fact that it's modular too. Um, we don't look at every single project as though it's going to be fully automated. There's capital budget constraints that have to be 
respected and, and there's limitations there. So we often talk about a, a multi-phase project with our customers. If, if you're looking to fully automate and, and the end goal five years from now is to be fully automated in a particular area, let's work in a phased approach. Uh, year one, year two, year three, whatever the case might be, we, we can put the solutions together. We can build the full solution, the end state, if you will, uh, from the very beginning in terms of, of the plan and, and what that solution looks like, but uh, create a multi-phase approach. And our systems are modular enough that we can add a checkbox destacker to the line. We can add something at the back end to restack checkboxes. We can add a separator uh, or a separator upgrade at some point. So all of our systems are scalable uh, based on the volumes, and there's also that element of modularity too, where they can be added at later dates. You don't have to get all the bells and whistles up front from the very beginning. So offering those those solutions uh, in, in a way that corresponds to, again, capital budget constraints or whatever else you might have within within the facility. When we look at um, production workflow and creating layouts. Again, just to sort of paint the picture, we have uh, on the screen here, we have a robotic rack unloader. So this robot is, is going in with a spoon and removing the egg flats from the, the rack or the trolley and placing them onto the in-feed conveyor. Here we have um, the, the Embrex Innovo solution where we are uh, removing clears, vaccinating in OVO, and then conveying it to a robotic transfer solution. So there's, again, as, as we've talked about before, there's inputs and outputs from this system. So we need to continuously um, charge this system with racks full of egg flats. And once it's done unloading the rack, we, we remove that empty uh, rack and we load a new one. So we look at placement within the hatchery. And this is where the relationship between uh, KL, Zoetis, and James Wade Chickmaster really starts to shine because this is where we work together from an engineering perspective, moving lines, you know, in the early phases of a, of a new project, it's just lines. So we have the flexibility to, to create the space that's optimum for the operation. We look at what the flow is. So in this case, from the setter rooms, we have racks coming to the, the system. And then uh, in this instance, we have stacks of, of uh, hatch trays with eggs that need to move to the hatcher room. So we look to position the equipment, place the equipment to optimize the flow. We try to optimize the traffic moving through the facility. We don't want cross traffic. We want as best as possible achieve one way through traffic and that's critical to every day putting the thought up front in this phase of the project is absolutely critical because you have to live with this equipment for the next 10 years so we want to make sure that we get it right and so our work with James Wade Chickmaster team we're able to adjust room dimensions. We're able to make tweaks to, to the room so that we get optimum flow so that we can we can configure our system to maximize that flow through the rooms. I mentioned earlier that we touch on closing the automation gaps. Um, you know, as an example, we have three uh, critical machines uh, that are used within most hatcheries. We have a we have a separator, uh, we have a hatch tray washer, and we have a chick counter, and so. Um, these three machines represent fairly significant investments for the hatchery. And so um, making sure that these machines are operating continuously is, is critical. It's critical to throughput. It's critical to manpower management, all of those elements. So where, where we find the, the, the gaps or the hidden factory, it's in areas where um, perhaps these machines aren't all fully integrated to one another. And so we look at these as individual machines. And our objective is to create, take a series of machines and create a system, a system that operates together, eliminating the gaps. 
Uh, oftentimes gaps are identified by uh, seeing lots of people around. So if you see lots of people in a particular area uh, trying to move stuff, there's congestion, there's traffic, that, that's a good sign that there's uh, a gap there that could be addressed. If you see um, people handling material more than once, uh, there's an inefficiency there. And so there's, there's a potential gap uh, in terms of the, the solutions that, that uh, could be available. So finding those gaps um, typically leads to the development of, of systems that, that work really nicely where, where, where systems or machines are integrated to work together. Uh, and so here's a, a perfect example of what we would call an integrated solution. So we've got the same elements that we spoke of earlier. So we have a separator we have a hatch tray washer. And then over here, we have a chick counter. In this example, we've also got a chick box destacker. So the separator is integrated to the hatch tray washer. The hatch trays are inverted and automatically conveyed into the washer. Uh, the chicks come out of the separator, again, automatically conveyed to the chick counter. And chick boxes, uh, clean stacks of empty chick boxes are loaded into the chick box destacker. Uh, and they're automatically conveyed to the chick counter, uh, filled to the appropriate volume, and then pushed out of the machine. So these are, these are those three critical machines um, in the hatchery fully integrated. Now we can get into much more complex examples of, of how uh, we can integrate machines into systems or integrated solutions, but this just gives you a high level flavor for what that looks like, what that, that uh, general arrangement would look like in, in a simple solution here. So service and support. Um, service and support, as anyone that knows the MBREX business model knows that um, the gold standard of service, uh, the bar in terms of what everyone else tries to achieve has been established by the Zoetis uh, field service teams. Uh, the support levels that are extended to our customers with the Embrex portfolio is second to none. And so our objective is to apply those same uh, principles to supporting our customers with automation as well. And, and if you look at the industry challenges and the Zoetis solutions, you see that we, we've worked quite consciously to, to try to address those uh, challenges in the development of our service portfolio. So in terms of <coughs> excuse me, production efficiency, employee satisfaction retention, we talked about replacing those very difficult jobs with automation, not necessarily displacing your labor, all of your labor, but picking those, that low hanging fruit, those difficult to do jobs, um, replacing it with well thought out automation. In terms of animal well-being, uh, chick quality, these are all um, elements, again, that, that drive our systems, our solutions, uh, our configurations. It, it, it's part of our DNA in terms of trying to make sure that we address those. Obviously, there's the dollars and cents behind um, every piece of equipment that you're considering. So trying to give you the best value uh, for your investment dollars uh, is an objective of ours. Certain elements, um, you know, the addition of process monitoring and all that stuff, th this, is, this is good uh, investment into technology that helps keep things safe in terms of biosecurity and ensure that you get the productivity that you need. Um, maintenance and equipment reliability is, is absolutely critical for day to day. When you show up at the hatchery in the morning and, and you have a hatch to run or a transfer to run, you need to know that your equipment is going to start up and operate. And you need to know that your technicians that you have on site will be able to relatively easily maintain the equipment and ensure that it's at optimum operating conditions. And certainly uh, from a project management perspective and, and trusted partners, really we have the benefit of, of um, providing automation to customers on a regular basis. Uh, very rarely do hatchery managers have the opportunity to completely retool their, their hatchery with new automation. Um, and because that happens so rarely, 
it's often challenging to predict what some of the, the issues might be in a capital project like that. And so our knowledge, our project management ability to support those efforts to ensure that um, all the important aspects of the project are understood and controlled. Uh, we consider ourselves an extension of your internal capabilities. We are an extension of your internal ability to, to help manage those projects. And our experience in the field will allow us to help guide you through that process because there are some challenges that are involved, but having somebody that, that does it day to day is a, is a significant uh, benefit. And so um, we have, again, to address a lot of those, those challenges the pro for service um, to, to ensure that you have an option for supporting you day to day in maintaining your equipment, uh, the wellness of your equipment, um, making sure that everything is, is configured and, and running in, in uh, tip top condition, making sure that the design manufacturing engineering, if we do a good job up front building the equipment, manufacturing the equipment, uh, we know that it will be reliable and, and last for many, many years to come. Having those machine controls, uh, understanding um, and having that visibility of how your equipment is performing and making sure that it's, it's in optimum condition. Again, day-to-day -day production support through that, that machine control and uh, complete visibility. In the event that you need support, remote connectivity, knowing that there's somebody there that can dial into your system, identify what, what might be the troublesome area, and try to walk you through the resolution. That's, that's a, a critical service, and that's adopting new technology that's available, available to us today. Um, and again, the, the, the journey for the customer um, trying to find the um, um, making sure that, that from a project management perspective, you get the support that you need, identifying the, the trades that are required for installing it, making sure that utilities and boiler sizing and all that stuff, these are all the areas that need to be considered and, and we can provide that support to you. We can help guide you through that. Uh, and so knowing that you have a trusted partner to work you through that is, is critical. And all of these elements contribute to peace of mind for the buyer. When we talk about our ability to, to service and support equipment, again, Zoetis has a physical presence um, in more countries than any of our competition. We, we, we are present in over a hundred different countries uh, and we have field service specialists in over 35 of those countries with most of them being, uh, with most, um, installations having somebody in an, uh, either the same country or an adjacent country so that you're speaking to somebody in the same language and the same time zone to help support you through any issues that you might have. Uh, Zoetis is committed to the service model, committed to supporting our customers in the field. Uh, the Embrex uh, success, the world-class level of, of support by Embrex is, is uh, as an example of that. And so we extend that same philosophy to our automation division as well. Uh, th this is an opportunity for me to, to uh, formally thank the, the James Wade Chickmaster team. Um, we have been working together uh, from KL products to KL automation from Zoetis uh, for, for more than two decades. Uh, we're just down the highway from one another um, and, and so we've, we've got a long history of working together. We've participated in trade shows together, project support, um, in terms of new product development, uh, we're continuously trying to work together so that we can offer the best solutions for our customers. I mentioned earlier about drawings and layout con configurations. Those are, that that's part of our day to day is working with the team at James Way and Chickmaster to, to try to, um, optimize the uh, the room configurations, the flow of material so that that customer has a flawless uh, um, execution of their project. Uh, the, the last slide um, 
you know, when it comes to identifying opportunities, we encourage you to reach out to, to your local Zoetis representative um, so that we can talk about short-term, long-term objectives. Let's openly discuss what the objectives are. Um, we, we want to provide solutions that will support you long-term. We don't want to talk about uh, uh, today's production volume, if you are having an, in if you're expecting to increase the production volume next year, let's talk about what those needs are in the near future and make sure that we size everything appropriately. Um, again, let's look for the hidden factory. Let's try to identify where those areas are of inefficiency, the redundant handling, the, the crowds. Um, th those are the things that that to us are are typically the low hanging fruit that that we want to look at. And then re reflect on, on your daily challenges from a production perspective. What are the issues? Is it inconsistent uh, working hours? Someday your transfer is five hours, some days it's eight hours. You know, let's look at what those um, situations are. Let's, let's try to identify where the challenges are and, and find the appropriate solutions that are well thought out and, and make good sense. And again, the Zoetis commercial and technical team, we're, we're here to help. Um, we, we thrive in, in solving problems. Uh, we, that, that's, that's what fuels us is trying to find a good, clean solution that makes sense um, and, and, and makes good justification from all the aspects of, of your day-to-day -day, uh, business. So, and with that, I, a, a big thank you to all the, the folks that have dialed into this uh, webinar, I, I appreciate uh, you giving me uh, part of your time and, and taking the time to listen to me. Um, there's myself and I've got two other colleagues that support the U.S. market, uh, Rick Bennett and Roger Chisholm, who, who unfortunately weren't able to join me today, but uh, are always available to support you with any opportunities that you're looking at uh, for your particular facility. So thanks to the, to the team at uh, JCMI for having me uh, present and, and I really appreciate uh, again the opportunity that you've extended to us so thank you very much for that and so with that I will uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you Jerry that was, that was very good very interesting um, <clears throat> nice uh, approach to things and seems like very flexible with the different customers and their needs and and such. Um, <clears throat> we had, had a couple questions or several questions in here some of them a little more thought provoking for you, but um, first, first of all, I mean, is, is there, what do you know about any type of energy savings or utilization if somebody switches this? I mean, how would that impact um, somebody's decision to go to autom automation? That's, that's a fair question. Um, I know that many geographic areas have challenges with uh, uh, the electric grid and, and the ability to supply uh, electricity. I can tell you that, you know, um, a robot, for example, it, it seems like a, a, a monstrous high voltage solution. Um, but the reality is, is that uh, in, in terms of a robot's power consumption, it's minimal. It's, it, it's 15 amps, which is the same as what you would have in a wall plug here in North America. So um, it, it and it's efficient use of of electricity too. When you're um, looking at chick conveyors and, and counters, it's all high efficiency motors that are selected. And so power consumption is not that significant. When you get into washers, washers certainly draw a lot more amperage. We have high horsepower, but that's an element of trying to be effective in terms of cleanliness. And that, that drives the selection of higher horsepower. Okay. Yeah, good an good answer. Yeah, and then, then you're right. That it depends on where you're at in the world too. Um, well, the, now you had mentioned in there. Um, you know, of course, this is the JCMI webinar. You'd mentioned um, your work with uh, JCMI or James Way and Chickmaster. Um, is your automation, I'm sure, is adaptable to any. Uh, I mean, somebody had asked a question and said, "Which one's best? Which flat is best?" I'm not going to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, it, it is adaptable to about any different type, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Uh, our preference is to work with JCMI products. That's, that's the plug. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> no, but honestly, we're, we're not overly sensitive to flats or baskets. For us, it's, it's a configuration of side guides and, and you know, um, uh, uh, stop mechanisms. So, so 
for us, there, there's incredible flexibility in terms of the way we design our equipment to, to work with the various products in the field. Okay. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, we appreciate the plug, but yeah, <laughs> but I, but I do, but I've seen your equipment different places. So uh, this, this question is kind of, it's interesting and I've seen this come up and there's probably not a direct answer for it, but is there a, a minimum weekly egg set or daily chicks produce that would benefit from automation? And I, and I know in different size hatcheries, they might go different ways, but in your experience, what, what do you think? I mean, I think everybody could use it to some extent, but what are your thoughts? No, no, you're absolutely right. And that's why we cater our systems to every possible volume, uh, depending on the, the number of eggs you set per week would determine which size washer we select, which size separator we select. So we try to have um, uh, a, a portfolio that addresses different volumes. And so um, we're, we're often challenged with that very same question, but there's so many other factors that go into that. You know, we can use labor rate as an example. The, the, the justification for adopting automation uh, in an area where the labor rate's really high, um, we, we can actually provide more elements uh, in a solution with a good ROI than we could in other markets where they have other challenges. So there, there's so many different factors that it is challenging to... Um, to uh, oh. Mike, your microphone got muted again, Jerry. Je we heard your answer, the whole answer, but it just got muted. Okay. Yeah, we heard, your, we heard your answer. It just ended right, right okay. at the end, so we got right. it. Um, okay. with, with the advancing in, in technology um, that, that we see all the time, I mean, what, what, how is your system set up to, you know, maybe then three to five years with things change? Is there going to be need to be serious upgrades or... Um, I mean, it's kind of the same equipment upgrading some of the other technology around it, or what's your response to that? There's, and it's funny, I listened to a podcast not so long ago where they talked about cell phones and how cell phone software is outgrowing the hardware within a couple of years. So, so in other words, the software requirements drive new hardware all the time. And it's interesting because for us, our hardware remains relatively unchanged over the last handful of years. Um, obviously, we're, we're making tweaks and changes to address um, animal welfare, for example, but from a hardware perspective, there's not a lot of change. For us, software is where there's lots of uh, change. Um, the, the HMI, which is the human machine interface, that's the, the, the station where the operator goes and interacts on a regular basis. We're seeing lots of improvements there where you have greater visibility of, of the machine uh, status. We can give you red lights, green lights, telling you exactly how all the equipment is, is performing and it's all interconnected. Um, those are the improvements that you see, but not necessarily does anything go obsolete. Um, you know, we're giving you the best that technology has to offer today and, and that technology that we're providing you has enough horsepower, we'll say working behind the screen to, to continue to support you and make sure that you've got a system that's fully functional for the next decade. Okay, good, good deal. Um, it, when, when you're working with different customers, I mean, you have, and I hear this as well, there's, there's some sense of resistance to buying into automation and stuff. Um, if you're working with a manager or some, you addressed a lot of the things in your presentation, but in short, you know, how do you kind of address that and say, okay, this is why you might really need this. Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about the old days, which is uh, physical hatchery visits, <laughs> you know, walking around a hatchery, seeing, seeing how things are operating. Um, maybe, maybe for a hatchery manager, they're, they're used to seeing groups of people doing stuff and picking this up and carrying it over there. For me, I may see it, an inefficiency there. I may see a challenge that they're facing day to day that they've just come to accept as, as part of everyday business. Whereas um, our team of commercial and technical people, we see it differently. We see that as potentially an opportunity. Why can't we put these machines closer together, put a conveyor between them, maybe destack this or restack that. So we, we come about your day-to-day -day operations with a, with a different set of eyes. 
and, and trying to identify those areas. And again, we're, we're not trying to eliminate everybody's jobs here. We're trying to find those areas where you have the greatest payback and, and finding that is a journey with the hatchery manager, with the hatchery personnel and the technical team at Zoetis. We work together to, to make sure that we scope a solution that makes sense, that has that, that good justification. Yeah, a good deal. Here's a question that I'm very quite interested in. <laughs> um, I'm always nervous when, <laughs> when you're queuing up another question. <laughs> um, anything, any anything in the in the near future of doing um, better egg breakouts without all the human intervention of doing the like the hatch residue breakouts and analyzing that? I mean, that'd be great if we had something. I don't know. I don't know whether you are <laughs> looking at something like that, but. I had to ask that because I want to know the answer too. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, if we did have something, I wouldn't be allowed to tell you. Um, I was thinking that, but it's probably a secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I can say that that's not, uh, that's not an area of focus for us right now. Um, really, you know, if, if we look at where the majority of our focus has been lately, and it's, it's the animal welfare, but it's also creating that that operator interface so that if you do uh, have any challenges with your system you can solve it quickly and get things up and running again that that to us is, is a primary focus um, there's there's lots of other areas for us to look at uh, in the future plenty of r d projects in the pipeline but uh, for now there's there's no egg breakout or anything like that that's uh <laughs> that's that on the horizon of anyway right <laughs> that's right yeah yeah after this call we'll chat <laughs> okay <laughs> good um do you have you have y'all looked into um like for some of your other automation in the hatchery of working through a leasing system like you do the innovo systems like the innovo jet systems i mean do you lease any of the equipment or is it all a you know purchase today it's purchase um i can say that that's because you know, capital equipment is typically on a purchase scenario. If you look at the Embrex portfolio, um, I, I, you know, when I when I look at leasing, I, I think of cars. Uh, if if after three or four years somebody doesn't want to lease that car anymore, uh, I have another customer that wants that exact same car. If you look at it from our business perspective, uh, a lot of what we do is very custom for the facility. So the opportunity for us to to take that equipment and move it somewhere else, if, if somebody decided they didn't want to keep it, um, it, it, it's a very difficult business scenario because a lot of those elements are cannot be applied to another site. Uh, you'd end up having a warehouse, uh, a giant warehouse for all the equipment that's just very specific to a specific application, and, and so that's that really is one of the challenges that we have from a from a leasing perspective. And that would be di different than the Innovo. It's the same. It's a, the same machine, and and you know you kind of ad adapt everything around it to make it fit in the system, but not that. So yeah, that, that makes exactly. Sense. Absolutely right. Um, makes perfect sense. Um, is there any improvements that are looking at as far as your shell chick shell planter modifications to um, you know because we see different people having issues with that. I mean, is something very new that you've come out with or new on the horizon, and or do you, something that maybe with changes in six chick size or whatever that might help? Yeah. So the the separator changes that I presented earlier um, that helps to address a lot of those concerns with the the plenum and the and the um, chick shell, what we call our cyclone. Um, so that development, that recent development is, is uh, reverse uh, compatible to, to systems that are out in the field today. So if you, you have an area that uh, is a, a concern to you, that cross conveyor uh, plus the plenum, we, we can look at uh, retrofitting that solution to your existing system. Okay. Do you all have, um, I know it's out there, just wondering if you all have that, uh, attendee asked, automation for removing eggs from boxes, you know, people that, particularly out of the U.S. that receive eggs, um, shipped in paper flats, paper cover boxes, do you have anything like that as far as removing them and transferring them over? So, we, we do have uh, a system that we've um, designed and is fully integrated and operational um, at a facility, and so, 
uh, if, if there's a specific need that a site has for a similar system, we, we'd be happy to look at it. Um, I wouldn't say it's part of our general portfolio today, but if, if, uh, if there's sufficient interest and the customer has a, a need, we, we'd be happy to look at that solution for them.